Every year, the university invites renowned scholars to deliver the Foundation Day Lecture. And this year, we feel privileged to invite the Honorable Vice-Chancellor of Assam Rajiv Gandhi University of Cooperative Management, Professor Deva Bhattadas, to deliver the keynote address. Prior to joining as the Vice-Chancellor of Assam Rajiv Gandhi University of Cooperative Management, Professor Das worked as a member of Arunachal Pradesh Private Educational Institutions Regulatory Commission, Itanagar. He is on deputation from the position of Professor in the Department of Business Administration at Tejpur University and held position of Head of the Department. He was also the Director of Center for Open and Distance Learning in Tejpur University. Earlier in his career, Professor Das also served in Gauhati University and Rajin Gandhi University. He has served as chair and is member of various national level committees and boards of UGC, AICTE, MEC and government. Professor Das is also member of statutory bodies of several universities, management institutions and colleges. Professor Das has completed senior academic leadership program from Said School of Business University of Oxford under leave of MHRD. He is also a qualified associate of In Insurance Institute of India, Mumbai. He has over 25 years of postgraduate and doctoral level teaching and research experience in various <coughs> universities in the discipline of commerce and management. May I now take the opportunity to invite Professor Devabhutta Das, sir, to kindly deliver the keynote address. Oprabhat. আৰু সকলো লৈকে মোৰ আজি এই সোতৰ বছৰীয়া আপোনালোকৰ ফাউণ্ডেশ্যন ডেট সকলো লৈকে মই মোৰ আন্তৰিক শুভেচ্ছা জ্ঞাপন কৰিলোঁ যিহেতু আমাৰ অনৰেবল ভাইচ চান্সেলৰ আৰু চিফ গেষ্ট অসমৰ বাহিৰৰ পৰা আহিছে গতিকে মই ইংৰাজীতে মোৰ কথাখিনি আৰম্ভ কৰিম অনৰেবল ভাইচ চান্সেলৰ অফ কে কে হেণ্ডিক State Open University, Professor R.P. Das, Chief Guest of today's function, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Igno New Delhi, Professor Nageshwar Rao Karu, Registrar of this university, Dr. A.K. Chaudhary, Senior Professor of this university, Professor N. M. Sarma. Sitting in front, Founder Vice Chancellor of KK Hendrick State Open University, Professor Sinan Purvasar. Another former Vice Chancellor, Dr. Dekasar. And I could see a galaxy of former officers sitting out here with whom I worked in different capacities in Guwahati University. Current <coughs> professors, faculty members, officers, staff members, students, center coordinators, gays, invited, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real delight to stand before you and take the podium for some time on this auspicious occasion to deliver a keynote address on Foundation Day of a university with whom I have been associated for, a, for different occasions and the university which is established in the name of a great scholar, Krishna Kanta Pandigwe. Today, we not only remember our, about our establishment of the university, but also remember about the personality on whose name this institution has set up. A great scholar, a great organizer, who established the first institution of 
higher learning institution of Assam, not only Assam of Northeast, that is Guwahati University, and to me, as per my little learning, could not see so far such a great scholar in Assam form. So we must remember his works, and also we must remember and follow his philosophy for scholarship and also for organizing the institutions. There are a couple of institutions after his name, but I would like to specially mention here that the KKK and Hendik Open University should take certain concrete steps so that his work and philosophy, his life should be researched and taken forward for further learning and for further analysis for the society. With this, I'd like to share some of the experience of mine, some of the thoughts of mine in the way of the keynote address, but then this is not a structured address. I would like to just give a form, informal kind of talk which may be not very technical. First of all, I would like to share before you certain data, not very technical, very simple data on achievements of the higher education in India. If you would like to look back on 70, completion of the 75th years of independence of India and where does the higher education space stand, then we see that the last couple of decades, especially last decade, has been very fruitful for Indian higher education space. If we see the decadal growth from 2060-60 onwards till the current decade, I am taking 2060-61 because <coughs> Prior to 6061, government actually had put the policies into place and took some preparation time. So data are available from 2060-61. Total number of universities in 6061 was 56 and colleges was 1500 or so. 1500, to be precise, 1542. During the next decade, 70-71, that number has doubled. In one year, it has doubled from 56, it, it became 102 for the universities. And in colleges, it has become 3,604. Likewise, in 2010-11, in 2010-11, we find that the number of universities is 256, and the colleges to 12,806. But in 2010-11, these 256 universities have become 343. Very stiff growth. And the colleges, 12,800 12, colleges have become 17,600 colleges. There are a good number of colleges and universities on the rise. But if you see, the last 10 years, 2020-21, data, it speaks that from 343, there are more than three times growth in 10 years and it has become now 1045 number of universities. And the colleges, 42,142. So, during the last decade, we see that there are more than 300 times, I mean 300 percentage of growth in number of higher education colleges and universities putting together. Today, if we put the colleges, universities and all other uh, uh, higher learning institutions, then we find that there are almost 50,000 you know, uh, educational institutions, which is a huge number of the institutions in the sphere of higher education. If we see the IIM and IIT and such centrally funded institution of national importance. Then we find that during last 20 years, last two decades, there are a huge number of 
colleges and university uh, institutions established under the IIM and IIT tech. If we see the central universities, state universities, deemed universities and private universities competition, then we find that during the last two decades, the number of private universities have emerged as a very important part of higher education and total number of today the private university is equal, almost equal to the state universities. So today the state universities, number of state universities 425 and number of private universities 375, almost same. And there are half a uh, century of central universities. So the higher education space is controlled by state universities and private universities only. If we talk about Assam, similar trend is shown. In 2010, we had nine state universities and two private universities. And during 2022, if we see, the data has gone to such point like from nine state universities, it has become 19 state universities. And from two private universities, there are now six private universities. So this shows us the picture that the last two decades, especially the last one decade, had been a great exponential growth for the Indian higher education system. However, if we see the growth of open universities, we do not see such kind of growth. That probably because of the fact that there is a principle that there should be only one state universities in a state, state open universities. And even then, there is no more than 14 state universities till date. Only one central university, that is called Indian Gandhi National Open University, there has been. So it shows that the growth of higher education has been tilted towards the regular mode of education or traditional mode of education as we say. It is not towards the open and uh, distance learning mode because of maybe another myth that the open university should not have any number of, any uh, limit of intent so they can give any number of intent. That is why there is no setup of two universities in a state or more than that. If we see the gross enrollment ratio, then we find that in 1960-61, the gross enrollment ratio was 1.5. The gross enrollment ratio means the number of qualified students and interested students to take up their higher education available divided by the enrollment, sorry, uh, uh, the enrollment number of higher education divided by the number of interested and qualified eligible students. So this ratio is called GER. So in 1960-61 it was 1.5, 70-71 it was 4.2 and it has gone to 19.4 in 2010 and 11 and it has become abruptly 27.1 in 2021. So there is also a stiff kind of uh, growth in higher education uh, in general uh, in GER gross enrollment ratio because the higher education institutions number has gone up. Here there are three system of three categories of the and gross enrollment ratio. One is called elite system, higher education as elite system. So when GER is below 15%, below 15% 1.5, uh, then this is called higher education elite system. And we have crossed that because it is more than you know 15%, we have crossed that and that system is called massification of education. So thereby, India has entered the massification of education 
in the year 2010-11, and now we are mid of massification because we have achieved 17.1. And the next stage is called universalization of higher education. And universal, universalization of higher education is that when the GER is more than 50%. So the target of India is to achieve the universalization that is 50% of GER by the year 2030. So, with this target, we are moving forward. China has already achieved, they have touched 50% and the advanced countries like Germany, US, those are about 80% of that. And uh, of course, in South, East, uh, South Asian countries, the India is one who has achieved that and most of the South Asian countries are below 15% uh, which are uh, struggling for massification of higher education. These are very rosy uh, data that I have shared with you, but one disturbing data that I am going to share with you, very small, is G GDP share in higher education. GDP share in education in totality was 1.4% in 2060-61, which has gone to, after 20 years, 2.98, after another 20 years, 4.14. It means it reached 4.14 in 2000, 2001, year 2000, 2001. And during last 20 years, what happened is it has gone from 4.14 to 4.1, 4.39. So there is basically, practically, there is no rise in the share of GDP towards the higher education. Number of higher education has increased manifold. Universities have increased, colleges have increased, everywhere the number has increased, but GDP share on the pie has not been increased. So this is a cause of concern and probably whatever we could see now as part the government's initiatives recently taken, we are hopeful that the 6% of GDP recommendation given by the then you know, uh, Education Commission, Policy Education Commission in 1986, probably this time is going to be fulfilled. And specifically for Assam, the number of uh, initiatives that have been taken by current government and the investment that they are promising, I hope that that would be even more than 6% in statewide GDP. These are some of the achievements that I have shared with you. Now, what are the actions that in 75th celebration of our uh, independence year, what actions have been taken so far higher education is concerned? We all know that NEP 2020 is going to be placed next year in Assam and for that matter in the entire country. And some universities have already started, like Delhi University, Lucknow University and Bangalore University, they have already started the new NEP. We are also going to start. So we are not going to repeat anything on NEP 2020. But the gist I am going to share with you is, there are certain areas where there is going to be a transformation in entire higher education space, be it regular or traditional education or distance education. The number one is, institutional transformation. We are going to see, we are going to witness a huge transformation in the entire higher education institutions. Maybe probably the colleges we see now would not be a college like this. Very soon that is going to be changed. It is also possible that we will not see the distance education universities as it is today. I don't know. Professor uh, Rao is uh, you know, learned person in distance education, he is in the helm of the affairs and he is in almost you know, all bodies related to higher education and especially in the ODA mode. But I, from my little knowledge, I foresee that years to come, there will not be bifurcation of the open and distance learning and traditional mode. Because all the policies, whatever policies we study now, talks about transformation and there is no bifurcation of ODA learning. Because they talks about all the time, you know, uh, superimposing the ODL system, superimposing online education, flexibility, 
student centric education here in regular mode also. In NEP also it is categorically mentioned that there should be 40% of MOOCs, there should be 40% of you know, uh, flexibility in credit transfer, there should be 40% of you know, uh, uh, online courses or so and so forth. So if it is so, then probably there is time to think about, again, about the future of the education, especially in, uh, you know, this uh, open and distance learning education, and also possibility of expanding its horizon to overlap the regular mode of education with the distance mode of education. Then the quality transformation. It talks about the quality transformation. What kind of quality is going to be there next? There are a lot of things there they want to show. They want to see that their education should be holistic. It should be multidisciplinary. It should be analytical. It should give the inquisitiveness to the students with the critical learning, critical thinking. Here probably the distance and open learning institutions have to rework and they have to redesign and redevelop their programs so that the specifically the analytical and critical thinking part to be incorporated. I understand closely from the ODL system because I have been working since my earlier career, earlier you know, uh, time in Guwahati University. I was the first coordinator of the entire, you know, largest center of the Northeast when I was working in Guwahati University. I was the founder director of ODL center in uh, Tejpur University. I have also been having the opportunity to work with Professor Rao while you know creating the manual for the ODL uh, NAC evaluation. What I understood from my reading is that giving study material, delivering uh, study material and ensuring that it reaches the students in time is not enough now to go you know, on giving the open and distance learning. Probably somewhere we have to ensure that they have achieved the objective of learning that they, we are going to deliver. Probably not only the study material, but probably could be something else on continued uh, monitoring and proctored way so that we ensure that their learning is happening. That is more important. I would like to share a very small story here to just, just cut the monotony. Is that one person, it's a life story, do not take it very seriously. One person from UK, research scholar, comes to India to do some research in village life of India. Then he roams around in the villages of West Bengal. And somewhere he, see, he witnessed that a cow is being worshipped by a lady. A cow is being worshipped by a lady. And then he thought, how come? Is it possible a cow is worshipped by human? Then he thought that maybe it is a special kind of cow. So she is worshipping. worshipping. Then he went by past. And he had seen after some time that in a wall of a uh, villager, it's a mud wall, and there are some of the you know, cow uh, that, what is called? Pitha, cow dung pitha. So that is being there very, very decoratively in the whole wall. From top to bottom, it's a very lined way. There are too many, you know, entire wall is covered with the cow dung, that kind of cake. So he thought, how come is he? He, he went, uh, you know, near to it, close to it, and he just saw like this and a smell and found it is a cow dung. Then he saw and he found, he, he was thinking, how is it possible that a cow go on doing, you know, potting like this, so stylish way, and then from top to bottom, you know, how is it possible? Then he finally concluded asking himself and getting the answer from himself is that because they are very powerful cows, because they can do all these things, that is why they are worshipped. So he went back and wrote in thesis that in Indian system, so cow is very powerful, 
they can do you know pass their stool in very decorative manner wherever they want very well sized and well designed and that is why they are worshipped now there is a gap what i mean to say here is that the inquisitiveness and analytical there are two different things and if you analyze if you do not analyze if you get the information from your knowledge that's fine but if you analyze without having proper inquisitive mind and critical thinking that is more dangerous better not to analyze you just get the information so probably we have to rethink you know about making our learners so that they get the information as well as they also inculcate critical thinking in their mind so that is what uh, probably need to you know redesign and rethink our open and distance learning here then another point of uh, action which is being designed by the uh, nep is inclusiveness and equity which is already there from earlier but in that case specifically the open and distance learning education has been from beginning people established with the objective of inclusivity and the equality so it is a in that case if there is a there is a ranking separate ranking parameter for inclusive and equity probably the open universities will be number 1 in the world probably who knows the igno will be world's first ranked uh, inclusive and equi equality education this is the largest educational institutions in in the, in, in the world which is named as people's university so we have that kind of university here and with the footprint of that university all the state universities are now doing similar way so for inclusivity and equality probably uh, the open and distance <coughs> learning education take the advantage of it but for inclusiveness sometimes <coughs> we limit by thinking that inclusive means those who cannot take education otherwise we have included those who are disadvantaged position we have included that is why we have ended up with inclusive inclusiveness probably this is the raw form of primary form of inclusiveness irrespective of caste creed you are including or other giving this disadvantage socially disadvantage physically disadvantage gender wise disadvantage people include that is a primary but the wholesome inclusive nameness is including inclusiveness in the syllabus in the course curriculum say for example now we see that traditional knowledge is culture yoga wellness all these things are included now there are there are there are talk of these things including in the syllabus so this is probably more one step ahead towards inclusiveness Inclus including the chapters on unsung heroes including the chapters on north east in national curriculum it, it, it does mean that irrespective of your geographical Spatial, cultural, historical, religious biasness. You should include everything in your design in syllabus. So that thereby probably we may work or rethink how we can make more inclusive in our design of curriculum and syllabi. There are talk. about the internationalization here also we need to talk thing about how internationalization can be done but internationalization simply doesn't mean that we go to foreign university we go to foreign and then give education or some foreign universities come to india to provide foreign education it means creating international environment in your university your university should be 
and internal circle university in terms of number one student diversity number two faculty diversity if you have in student diversity if you have students from 29 different countries if you have faculty and researcher from 18 different countries that probably is a real sense of internationalization apart from that to achieve that you have different modes that modes may be dual degree that mode may be joint degree there may be collaboration there may be student exchange program there may be faculty exchange program these are mode but we should not talk about the modes but we should talk about the principle of it. Then there are a lot of modes and we can take one or two which is suitable for us. So there probably we have to think about uh, for, actually this is for a traditional university as well. It is not only for open and distance education. Another very important thing is that when we talk about globalization, uh, transformation, there is a global call. This, apart from this uh, local MEP thing, the similar way we find that the globally the transformation call is going on. It is not that only India is thinking about the transformation. In May, in Barcelona, there is one UNESCO World Higher Education Conference, and they say they have prepared roadmap to 2030. And in 2030, they said that there are suggested six principles to be followed by higher education institutions worldwide and they are number one greater inclusion and promoting diversity the same that we have already discussed this is a meeting held in may 2022 unesco meeting second is academic freedom balanced by public accountability third is Enquiry, critical thinking and creativity. Unlocking the potential of every kind of science literacy. Four, integrity and ethics. Generating new kind of citizenship in future, which is in the making in India. India. Fifth, uh, so fifth is a commitment to sustainability and social responsibility. And going forward one step, they have also asked all the higher educational institutions over the globe is to contribute to the 17 uh, sustainable development goals with 169 targets. The categorically mentioned, though four is, uh, goal four is specifically for inclusiveness and equality in higher education, but all the 17, 16 other goals also have to be addressed by the higher education institutions. And I'm very happy to see that there is a separate ranking for the world universities, separate ranking for the world universities, which uh, are ranked as per the goal. Just to say a few, is that in 2022, Times Impact Ranking Goal, Impact, impact Ranking on Goals. And the number one goal, No Poverty, the award goes to Western University, Canada. And as this is two, zero hunger, it goes to Hokkaido University, Japan. Number three, good health and well-being, it goes to Iran University of Medical Sciences, Iran. Number four, quality education, it goes to Alborg University, Denmark. Gender equity, it goes to Chiang Mai University. Clean water sanitation, it goes to Western Sydney. Affordable clean energy, it goes to Fudan University, so and so forth. There are a whole list that all universities are contributing towards the sustainable development goals and they are getting awards. Here I would like to make a comment or tippany is that we also in India should not go haphazardly for all 17 goals and 169 targets. Whenever there is a letter comes, we will do something, upload photos and gone. And the next activity comes and we do it wholeheartedly and then after that event is over, we are also fine. So instead of doing that, I think all universities should, you know, holistically think as per their expertise and capacity and capability, take one or two SDG and should work on that. So that we can achieve, we can so show something, some results on that particular goal. For example, Honorable Vice Chancellor has explained that 
this university has adopted five villages for some uh, activities. So, what kind of activities? Now, which goal they are going to achieve? That is to be determined. That these five villages we have taken, we are putting intervention on a particular or two particular goals. We are not going to do anything else than that. So that we can show something to the world that yes, we have made some change of the lives of these five villages. Then uh, another is cooperation for excellence and rather than competition. That is also another, another kind of appeal that they are making that universities should not compete with each other but they should cooperate worldwide. So that entire entirety of the education is enjoyed by all the student community and they are asking to make it more student centric. So they presume that eventually there are four situations that can happen in higher education and that higher education is uh, documented in a report called the reimagining of future of higher education report. It is published by UNESCO. And they say these four scenarios are number one, please mind it, number one is open education. They could foresee that future of education is having four scenarios. Number one is open education. Number two is technology enables network learning hubs. Number three, ecologically sustainable higher education. And number four, development driven higher education. These are the four scenarios that is foreseen by the UNESCO in coming decades. And I'm sure that here open and distance learning has to play a very important and greater role. These points, these scenarios reminds me the University of London, there is a part of University of London is called Big Back. Big Back. You can Google it and you can find that that is called uh, London's Evening University. It's a part of London University, University of London. I had the opportunity to visit that. And I could see, I was overwhelmed by seeing how the education is being done. It's not exactly open and distance education. But then probably that is the future of open and higher education, open and distance education. What they do is, it's a part, it's a kind of evening university, but it is, class is done from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. People walk whole day and they come in the evening to take classes. But there is not necessary that every day you attend the classes. What is necessary is, you have to attend the classes wherever you are in. There are recorded classes, there are a lot of kiosks. Outside, there are a lot of kiosks. Suppose you miss the class, you come to the next class, you are not allowed to sit in the live class unless and until you do the recorded class in the kiosk or somewhere from somewhere else with your own equipment. So I have seen the students coming and sitting in kiosk and they are attending the classes. After the class is over, there are small kind of set of questions. They have to fill it up there. So that it is ensured that they have already done that, gone through that. There are some question answers. So they give the answers and then they are allowed to sit in the classroom next. So probably this is a kind of, uh, you know, alternative model of education that can be initiated by open and distance learning universities like uh, KK and Dikopel University. Ecologically sustainable higher education that I am not going to talk much because it is already the higher education system and the open and distance learning education who is more having, you know, it's, there is a research also. The other day I, have, I was reading uh, the lecture of uh, Professor uh, Asha uh, Kanwar, who is the chairperson of, president of uh, COL, component of learning. In her recent lecture in component of learning, I had seen that there are research which tells that the carbon footprint is much, much lesser 
by the occurring distance learning education compared to the regular mode of education or traditional mode of education. So that way also the open and distance learning is much, much, much ahead. It is also been found in research as shared by you know Professor Asha Kanwar, president of COL, is that the blended learning mode of education has better learning experience than the regular mode of education. That is also uh, uh, worked by the research. So I advocate here that while congratulating the KK Hendig Open Universities for achieving the landmark of 34,000 students enrollment, which is very good, to ponder how now the university will justify giving the proper learning, just learning, holistic learning, critical thinking, analytical skill to those 34,000 students. And that is the challenge. In open and distance learning, I know the number of students that you require, uh, sorry, number of teachers you require per students is not there. And probably now we have to rethink on that. What is the exact ratio of the student teacher we have to maintain? Because in a classroom, in traditional mode, we do not go beyond 1 is to 20. We do not go beyond 1 is to 20. But in that way, if you have to cater 34,000 students, you must have some teachers. So how do you come to that? Here I would like to also say, please give me indication if I have crossed that time. <laughs> So, uh, here another thing comes to my mind, there is a ranking, you know, universal ranking. And the main two ranking, rather three rankings are, number one is QS ranking, number two is Times Higher Education ranking and number three is Shanghai ranking. The Shanghai ranking we will not compare because we cannot go even, you know, close to them because they are only based on the Nobel laureates and free field awards of their faculty members and alumni. These two are the most important criteria of Shanghai. Although we say that Shanghai is an Asian ranking, but that is the toughest ranking, if I have to say. Because the highest number of weightage is given on the number of Nobel laureates and field awards your teachers have got and your alumni have got. Where India will be close to know. Now, talking about the QS ranking and Times Education, Higher Education ranking, if you are talking about those ranking, believe me, there is no any criteria on high ODL mode. There is no separate ranking for ODL. You have to compete with the traditional mode of learning. <coughs> and as I tell, tell you, I foresee that tomorrow there will be an overlapping of open and distance learning education. You have to target the QS ranking or Times Higher Education ranking. And days are coming that government will also link up the institutional fund and other things, facilities with the ranking. Now, 40% of the QS ranking, 40 weight, 40% 40 weight comes from academic reputation. 20 comes from faculty student ratio. And 20 comes from publications. The 80, 80 rank out of 180 comes from your research. That academic reputation means the research. Why it is research? Because that reputation is done by reputation survey of world over. The QS ranking authority will send questionnaire to renowned professors and academicians around the world to tell about 10 of the institutions of their country and 50 of the academic institutions around the world. So on the basis of what? Research. Research is only the passport where you will be you know, introduced in the entire world. Be it in open or distance education or in higher education. The times higher education also is like the teacher students ratio number of faculty members publication, impact factor and all that, age index and all that, and this academic survey. So what I mean here, mean here is, it is time to think about research alongside the teaching. One I have said, the quality of your education, number of enrollment achievement is one success, but another success, more important, more crucial, is how to maintain the quality. 
because we claim that it is equivalent than equivalent of a regular degree. MBA from Tejpur University and MBA from KK Hendrik Open University will be same. MBA from Delhi University of MS will also be having the same claim. But can we claim same quality from our students? There are two different notions I would like to tell you here. One is notion of the faculty members and the outsiders and notion of the students. Now, very dangerous thing is that there is a notion of the students that this mode of education is a softer option for us to get a degree. So when these kind of students come, it is even more dangerous. That is why we must be very careful offering the degrees and offering the education unless and until it is a, a good education, really equivalent education in terms of quality, I tell you, this high number of enrollment will be boomerang. Talking about the research, if you are not doing research as a faculty members, then you are perishing and you are vanishing yourself from the picture of the higher education. And then tomorrow when suddenly it will come that open education now can offer you know, a regular education also. And days to come, you have to start the blended mode of education. I advocate the blended mode of education. Even before COVID, also I was advocating in my university, Tesco University, to start the blended mode of education. But there was nobody to listen to me. But suddenly when COVID outbreak happened, then Vice Chancellor calls me and tells me, Are, what kya bol rahe tumhi, arbo, so suddenly we had to do that, but it was not exactly blended mode because there is a technicality in blended mode. It is not. Now university, all the universities are in the name of blended mode. What they are doing is they are clubbing some online classes and then at the ease of the faculty members and the ease of the students, some classes are given online and they say we are giving blended mode. It is not. There is a technical course in technical training is given by the COL, Commonwealth of Learning. All the faculty members of ODL mode should go for that training. I am sure that you know more than half of you have already completed. If you if you have not, then please go through one program offered by Athabasca University and Commonwealth of Learning about blended mode. I have done that in, uh, in, 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 in online mode. And you will know how you design your one course on blended mode. You can do experimentation. You can do experimentation by one program through blended mode. It is not online mode, it is not offline. There are a lot of activities designed, synchronized and asynchronized activities, which you can offer now also. Taking one paper of yours, one course of yours, at least initially, and then you will, when you get the test, you will automatically go to the blended mode of learning. And it has been already established by the research that the blended mode of education has better efficiency than even the regular mode of education. Not to talk about the other uh, uh, traditional ODL mode of education. Uh, with this, I will not uh, go much into uh, it. With this, I would like to congratulate all the faculty members, all the staff, all the students, all the uh, uh, officers of this university along with the members of all the statutory bodies present here and the founder vice chancellors who have started this institution with so much difficulty. I know starting a institution, an institution and university how much difficult it is because currently I am also facing similar kind of thing though I am not, a, not the first vice chancellor but for all practical purposes, I am I becoming I'm, I have become the first vice chancellor kind of thing. So I I now realize what is the pain of being a vice chancellor. So I honestly, from my core of the heart, I congratulate founder vice chancellor, former vice chancellor Professor Deka, and other officers, retired officers. Mr. Uh, Dr. Sharma Sir is there, who was a registrar when I was uh, in Guwahati University. Later on, he joined here. I see a lot of known faces. Finance and accounts officer, earlier finance and accounts officer, current officers, and current leadership. Without his vision, I know whatever I have said will go into futile. And I would like to see that more researcher, more research paper in terms of good journals, impact factor will come out of here. May it be ODL mode, may it be your own uh, discipline or area. And I'm sure that this university has been 
the leader of the northeast so far odl is concerned and it will be the leader in future coming days also and for giving this opportunity sometimes somewhere i have studied and uh, that when you keep a patience on god it is called faith when you keep patience on your elders it is respect when you keep patience on your family members it is love so you have put patience here on me so i can assume that it is your love for me with that i would like to hear from you thank you